Hey guys, Mr. Weaver here. I'm going to go ahead and go over the reading guide for part two. I'm going to start making videos for these. That way the virtual students uh, will be able to uh, have examples of us going over these questions. And this will hopefully also act as a good way for us to be studying for the quizzes that we have. So we're going to go ahead and start with number one here. Uh, what I'll do for these is I'll go over each question and I'll show you where I found it in the text. You may be able to find these in other places, um, but I'll at least be able to show you where you know I found it. Okay, so let's go look for why is even-handed enforcement of contracts an important source of prosperity. So if we go over here, <clears throat> it's actually in the first paragraph. We can see that they start off saying the legal system provides the foundation for the protection of property rights and enforcement of contracts. As we discussed in element four of part one, trade moves goods to people who value them more and make larger outputs possible as the result of gains from specialization and large scale production methods. To reduce the uncertainties of accompanying trade, a legal system must provide even handed enforcement of contracts. This increases the volume of exchange and the gains from trade and thereby promotes economic progress. You know, for instance, you're more likely to trade with somebody if you know that they're going to, you know, be, you know, if they're going to honor your trade, right? If they're not going to, you know, uh, trade with you and then sucker punch you and then take the right back, right? Uh, you're more likely uh, to trade with somebody when you know that your, you know, your your trade is going to be you know, agreed upon. Uh, you're going to be making tra contracts with people if you know that those contracts are going to be upheld. Yeah. So uh, we got that done. Let's go ahead and go on to number two. Can the owners of property do anything they want with the things they own? Why or why not? So I found this answer right here in this paragraph. I'll go ahead and read it. Private owners can decide how they will use their property, but they are held accountable for their actions. People who use their property in a manner that invades or infringes on the property rights of another will be subject to the same legal forces that protect their own property. For example, private property rights prohibit me from throwing my hammer through the windshield of your automobile because if I did, I would be violating your property right to your car. Okay, So I can't do whatever I want. I have to still... I can't use my property for whatever I want because I still have to make sure that I'm not violating someone else's, right? But so long as I'm not violating someone else's property rights, I'm A-OK. -okay. What are the four reasons why the incentives provided by property rights promote economic progress? So these are actually labeled uh, throughout these paragraphs pretty easily. So let's go ahead and read those. First, private ownership provides people with a strong incentive to maintain and care for the items they own. There you go. Uh, it gives you an incentive to keep your items in top-notch uh, condition. If they fail to maintain the property, they will, or if they allow it to be abused or damaged, they'll bear the consequences, right? Um, you know, I don't want my factory to fall into disrepair because then it's not going to be able to produce as much. I want to keep, you know, good care of my car, as they say here, because then it'll be worth more on the market if I ever try to sell it later. Whereas, you know, if I didn't take care of it, it wouldn't be worth that much, okay, or as much, I should say. Second, this is the second reason. Private ownership encourages people to use and develop their property in ways that others value. If they employ their property, if they employ and develop their property in ways that others find attractive, the market value of the property will increase. In contrast, changes that others dislike, particularly if the color, if the others are customers or potential future buyers, this will reduce the value of one's property. Right? I could paint my car bright neon pink, and that would ruin the value. Right? There'd be many people would not want it as much. Okay. Uh, let's go look at third here. Third, private ownership makes owners legally responsible for damages imposed on others as a result of how their property is used. Okay, Again, private ownership makes owners legally responsible for damages imposed on others as the result of how their property is used. Um, so it makes me want to use my property in such a way that it's not going to hurt someone else. Right? I don't want to have a a, a merry-go-round in my backyard with chainsaws on it because it sounds super metal and cool because I know that that then makes me, you know, have a risk in my backyard of someone to come onto my property and hurt themselves, right? So I don't want to have that, okay? This is why a lot of people, you know, if you maybe ask your, you know, uh, folks at home, hey, can we get a trampoline? They'll tell you no, right? Even if you could afford one, they'll say, I don't want one because I don't want some, you know, kid coming and breaking themselves. Fourth, Private ownership promotes the conservation of resources for the future as well as wise development. Okay? Using a resource may generate revenue, which reflects the desires of present consumers who want what the resource can provide. But future consumers also have a voice, thanks to property rights. As an owner of a resource, say a woodlot or a small forest whose trees could be harvested now or later, faces a decision. Will the timber be more valuable later? In other words, will the expected value of those trees 
they, when they are more mature, be greater than if they are logged today? And will that value exceed their value of harvested now by more than the cost of holding and protecting them for future use? If so, the owner has an incentive to conserve. That is to hold back, right? So if those trees are going to be worth more in the future, you might as well wait. Because if you can, it, you're, if you can wait to the future, you're going to get more, right? Uh, which then tells you that it's it'd be less profitable to harvest them now. And we know that we do things that are more profitable. So uh, this gives us a reason to conserve, okay? If you need to go over those four things again, you can go ahead and back up the video and watch it again. Four, do you think this world will soon run out of important natural resources such as oil and timber? Why or why not? And they have a great, uh, a great uh, set of paragraphs here that explain this. And I'm gonna go ahead and read them all, okay? In the middle of the 19th century, dire predictions arose that the United States was about to run out of whale oil, the primary fuel for artificial lighting at the time. No one owned the whales, which were being hunted to excess on the high seas. If a whale hunter failed to take a whale when the opportunity arose, someone else would probably do it in the near future. As whale oil rose in price, the incentive for individuals to conserve whales for the future was missing because private property was absent. No one limited the whale hunting, even though the whale population was declining. However, the whale oil prices strengthened the incentive to find and develop substitute energy sources. If entrepreneurs could develop a cheaper new energy source, they could turn substantial revenues. With time, this led to the discovery of commercially profitable sources of petroleum. The development of relatively cheaper kerosene, a resulting drop in the price of whale oil, less whale hunting, and thus the end of the whale oil crisis. Later, as people switched to petroleum, predictions emerged that this resource too would be exhausted. In 1914, the Bureau of Mines reported that the total US supply of oil was under six billion barrels, about what the United States now produces every 40 months. In 1926, the Federal Oil Conservation Board estimated that the U.S. supply of oil would last for only seven years. More recently, a study sponsored by the highly influential Club of Rome made similar predictions for the world during the 1970s. Understanding the incentives that emanate from private ownership makes it easy to see why doomsday forecasts have been so wrong. When the scarcity of privately owned resources increases, the price of those resources will rise. The increase in price provides consumers, producers, innovators, and engineers with incentives to one, conserve the direct use of the resource, and two, search more diligently for substitutes, and three, develop new methods of discovering and recovering larger amounts of the resource. To date, these forces have pushed doomsday even further into the future, and there is every reason to believe that they will continue to do so for resources that are privately owned. Right? Uh, so because these resources are owned, uh, there's a reason for people to do these three things. Conserve on them, uh, search for substitutes, and develop new ways of getting them, right? So from what they're saying here, uh, as long as they're privately owned, there's not going to be a reason for them to go, uh, you know, sneak at one point, you know, people are like, oh my gosh, the whales, they're going to be gone. And then we find a substitute, so we stop going after the whales, right? Uh, people have been predicting for forever that we're going to run out of oil, uh, but because of the, the price of oil, you know, increasing over time, it, it encourages people to find new methods of getting and using and conserving on oil. Okay, so the next question here is, in a competitive market, what happens to firms that fail to provide consumers with desired goods prices equal to or less than those available from other firms? So if we go to 2.2 here, it's actually in the first paragraph. Uh, competition, it says, competition weeds out inefficient producers. Firms that fail to provide consumers with quality goods at attractive prices will experience losses and eventually be driven out of business, All right? So they end up leaving. They stop selling their item and they get out of that market, right? What must a firm do in order to compete effectively? And that's also in this paragraph. Uh, successful competitors, they have to outperform their rivals, okay? So you could just put that, you could also put, they may do this through a variety of methods, including the quality of the product, the style of the product, the service level of the product, the location of the product, advertising, and the price of the product, okay? They must consistently offer consumers with as least, at least as much value relative to the cost as is available from rivals, okay? So they have to outperform the rivals, okay? When markets are competitive, who determines whether a new innovative, innovative product will be successful? If we scroll down here. Consumers are the ultimate judge and jury of business innovation and performance. Number four, 
What determines whether corporations, individual proprietorships, employee-owned firms, consumer cooperatives, or some other form of business structure will dominate in a market? Well, competition also discovers the business structure and size of the firm that can best keep the per unit cost of a product or service low. Um, these paragraphs that I'm going to highlight right uh, here, uh, I'm going to then exit out of it that way don't highlight them. But th that is a very good job of saying, you know, hey, sometimes it, uh, large companies are better at providing a certain product. Sometimes small companies are better at providing a certain product. Okay, and competition is able to show us, uh, you know, whether or not it should be small companies or large companies um, supplying a product. What is creative destruction? Give an example. Okay, this here, this paragraph, is. Uh, where it talks about creative destruction. History abounds with examples. The automobile replaces the horse and buggy. The supermarket replaces mom and pop grocery stores. Fast food chains like McDonald's and Wendy's largely replace the local diner. Walmart and Target grow rapidly while others retailers contract. And firms like Montgomery Ward and Kmart are driven out of the market. MP3s and iPods replace the CD player, which had previously displaced the cassette decks and record players. Personal computers replace typewriters, and smartphones substitute for less mobile computer devices. One could go on and on with similar examples. The great economist, Joe Schumpeter, referred to this dynamic competition as creative destruction, and he argued that it formed the very core of economic progress. So what you know, we're talking about creative destruction here, and we're talking about all of these new products replacing the old products. Okay, If, if you were a person um, that made a typewriter, you were out of work when personal computers came out and people could do word process, processing on personal computers, right? So we are destroying uh, you know, old products and all the machines that were used to make the typewriters, right? All those things are gone now and they're being replaced with these new, much better things. Okay, this is what he was calling creative destruction. I'm sure that you guys uh, can think of all sorts of things that have been replaced with new and better products, right? You could even use one of the examples that are in that paragraph if you so choose, okay? I believe we're on to the, nest, the, the last page here. What are the three ways that regulations limit exchange and reduce the competitiveness of markets? Let's go take a look-see. If you notice here, the, they're actually um, written out. So I highlighted the wrong paragraph here. Anyways, what are three ways that they limit competition? First, regulations often restrict entry into markets. Many countries impose regulations that make it difficult to enter and compete in various businesses and occupations. In those countries, if you want to start a business or provide a service, you have to require a license, fill out forms, get permission from different bureaus, show that you're qualified, indicate you have sufficient financing, and meet various other regulatory tests. Some officials may refuse your application unless you're willing to pay a bribe or contribute to the political, uh, political coffers. So they limit who can enter the market right? Second, regulations that substitute political authority for the rule of law and freedom of contract will tend to undermine gains from trade. Several countries make a habit of adopting laws that grant political administrators substantial discretionary authority. For example, in the mid-1980s, customs officials in Guatemala were permitted to waive tariffs if they thought that doing so was in the national interest. Such legislation is an open invitation for government officials to solicit bribes. It creates regulatory uncertainty and makes business activity costlier and less attractive, particularly for honest people. Popular support for regulation often stems from the desire to promote cleaner environment or provide consumers with a protection against unscrupulous business operators. Regulations can play a positive role in these areas. Even here, however, the laws need to be precise, unambiguous, and non-discriminatory. If it's not, they're going to be a roadblock from trade, right? Um, so we can see here, they can substitute political authority, uh, kind of for, uh, you know, just some, some amb ambiguity, right? So instead of, you know, Hey, we're not going to trade uh, with you because this product's bad. Uh, it's instead, you know, Hey, we're not going to trade with you because you haven't paid me enough money. Right. And of course, if you pay the politician enough money, well now you can trade all of a sudden. Okay. Third, the imposition of price controls will also stifle trade. Government sometimes set prices above the market level. For example, some governments require that producers of various agricultural products be paid a specified minimum price for their commodities. At a higher set price, buyers will purchase fewer units than they otherwise would. 
Governments also set prices lower than the market level, as in the case of apartment rate controls and regulated electric power rates. In terms of, of units produced and sold, it makes it little difference whether price controls push prices up and force them down. Both will reduce the volume of trade and the gains from production and exchange. This in green here, I'm actually going to read this because this is a very, very uh, good example for the next question, okay? Where are we here? What are the secondary effects of raising the minimum wage, okay? What are the secondary effects of raising the minimum wage? Minimum wage weights, wage weights, minimum wage rates are perhaps the most commonly imposed price control throughout the world. A minimum wage rate establishes a price floor that pushes the hourly wage of some workers and jobs above the market level. It is currently a hot topic in the United States. Several leaders of both major political parties have called for a higher federal minimum wage. Moreover, several cities, including Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, recently adopted $15 per hour minimum wage rates. The basic postulate of economics indicates that a higher minimum wage will reduce the employment of low-skilled workers. There is some controversy about the size of the employment reduction, but the weight of the empirical evidence indicates that each 10% increase in the minimum wage will reduce employment between 1 and 2%. Because the wage increases are substantially larger than the reductions in employment, a higher minimum wage will nearly always increase the total earnings of low-skill workers. The proponents of higher minimum wage believe that the, the, the higher total earnings are well worth the cost of relatively small reductions in employment. Many supporters of a higher minimum wage also believe that it will reduce the property weight. At first glance, this appears to be true, but examination of the data indicates that it is highly questionable. There are three major reasons why this is the case. First, the bulk minimum wage employees, about 80%, are members of households with incomes above the poverty level. One third in households with above average incomes. Half of the minimum wage workers are between the ages of 16 and 24 years, and most of these work part-time. One out of every seven minimum wage workers, about 15%, is the primary earner for a family with one or more children. Thus, the typical minimum wage worker is a single, youthful, part-time, secondary worker in a household with an income above the poverty level. Second, there will be unintended effects of the higher minimum. Here we go. Employers will take steps to control or compensate for their higher wage costs. These will include a reduction in the hours worked fewer training opportunities, a less convenient work schedule, and fewer fringe benefits. Further, many of the minimum wage workers are also consumers of products impacted by the higher minimum wage. These workers will have to pay higher prices for goods such as fast food. Thus, the actual compensation for minimum wage workers will increase by less than the expansion in the minimum. Finally, more than half of the poor families in the United States do not have anyone in the labor force and therefore a higher minimum wage will not help them. The data presented here are from government sources and widely accepted by professional economists. When thinking about the effects of minimum wage on youthful low-skilled workers, it is important to consider the impact in both the short and long run. Work experience provides youthful workers with an opportunity to develop self-confidence, good work habits, and skills and attitudes that will make them more valuable to future employers. This opportunity is particularly important for high school dropouts and others with weak educational backgrounds. Unless these young people are able to prove their value to employers and develop on-the-job skills, it is unlikely that they'll be able to move up in the job ladder and realize higher earnings in the future. Okay, So uh, you notice here there's a lot of secondary effects. Uh, one was in that paragraph I just read where it becomes harder for the less educated to get jobs. It also makes it so products are more expensive and those that are typically buying the products that become more expensive are those that uh, uh, would be put out of work or maybe even gain a little bit of a raise from a increase in minimum wage. So we gotta make sure that we're not just thinking about how we can you know, try to solve all the world's problems by you know, passing these regulations because it does sound like a good idea at first, but of course when you consider the secondary effects, you can see that the minimum wage really isn't going to uh, solve all of our problems that we think it's going to solve. So, on to number three, how will regulations that make it more costly for an employer to lay off or dismiss current employees affect the unemployment rate of youthful workers and other new labor force entrants? What I have highlighted in yellow here does a good job of explaining that. I feel like we have to read both paragraphs to really get an understanding of it. 
Regulations are particularly important in labor markets. Many countries have imposed regulations that interfere with and undermine the use of contracts or voluntary agreements to deal with various issues. Dismissal regulations provide an example. A number of European countries require employers who want to reduce the size of their workforce to 1. Obtain permission from political authorities, 2. Notify the dismissed employees months in advance, and 3. Continue paying the dismissed employees for several more months. Such regulations may appear to be in the interest of workers, but the secondary effects must be considered, right? Because we're thinking up here, wow, it makes it so it's harder to fire people and only the only people that deserve to get fired get fired, right? Well, let's see what happens. Regulations that make it costly to dismiss workers also make it costly to hire them. Employers will be reluctant to take on additional workers because of the high dismissal costs. As a result, it will be difficult for new labor force entrants to find jobs and the growth of employment will be slowed. This has been the case in European countries where restrictive labor market regulations are more pronounced than in the United States. Such regulations are a major reason why the unemployment rates of Western Europe countries such as Italy, Spain, and France have been four or five percentage points higher than the United States in the past couple of decades. While hiring and dismissal regulations are generally less restrictive in the United States than in Europe, occupational licensing is a major labor market restriction in the United States. Okay, uh, We talked about that in class, but what this question is particularly talking about is this up here, and it makes it harder to hire people. right? If it's harder to fire them, then you really got to be careful about who you're hiring, right? Because if you just can't, you know, if you, if you want to take a risk on somebody, you know, if you take a risk and they're a bad worker, you can't just get rid of them, right? So it makes it costlier to hire people. Our living standard is directly linked to what? You guys should know this because it was from another um, section, but I'm going to go ahead and read in the green here and the answers in the, in the yellow, okay? Regulations often appear to be an easy way to solve problems. Want higher wages? Increase the minimum wage. Want a lower unemployment rate? Pass laws, making the dismissal of workers more difficult. Want higher earnings in an occupation? Restrict the entry of price cutters. But there is a problem here. These simplistic policies do not enhance the production and they ignore the secondary effects. Here we go. Our living standard is directly linked to the production of goods and services that people value. It's not jobs that matter. It's the stuff that we make that people value. That's what matters. Mutually advantageous trade and competitive markets encourage efficient use of resources and discovery of better ways of doing things. They help us get more value from our resources. Thus, regulatory policies that impose roadblocks against trade and entry into markets will almost always be counterproductive. If a country is going to grow and prosper, it should minimize regulations that restrict trade and the competitiveness of markets. Guys, thank you for watching. I hope you were able to get your reading guide done. If you have any questions, please let me know. I will see you uh, in the next lecture. And you guys have your quiz tomorrow. Good luck. Do not rush through the attempts on your quiz. Instead, look up your answers in the book. Look at your study. Look at your reading guide. Or ask me, please, please don't rush and try to do your best. Have a good one, guys. I'll see ya.